Well, good morning, church. It is good to be back. Let me say that more convincingly. It is good to be back. Was that better convincing? Was that more convincing? Or more convincing? Better convincing? Oh, something like that. I will tell you very tr truthfully and honestly, it is difficult. I am not used to getting up early in the morning anymore. Not used to wearing clothes. I wore shorts and a tank top. And maybe shoes once in a while. So, but it is good to be back, seriously. Hawaii is beautiful, Hawaii is wonderful, but still, it is Hawaii. Nothing like, as, as uh, who is that, Dorothy says in, in the land of Wizard of Oz, no place like what? Yeah, there's too much written into that too, so. <laughs> So we're going to start, as I was uh, on vacation, and I thank you for, uh, first I'm grateful to God and to you for, uh, for allowing myself and my family to go on vacation. And we're thankful for that, and we're thankful that, you know, many folks stepped up and filled the gap, David leading praise, and, and just continuing, and pa especially Pastor Jake, you know, for filling in and stepping in, because he's got a hard job, you know, as it is. He's dealing with all the young youngsters and getting ready to go on mission and all those things. So if you see Pastor Jake again, just tell him thank you. And I really appreciate him stepping in. You know, we're glad to be back, but my grandson was not glad. He wanted to stay one more week, another week, another week. And I was kind of thinking, yeah, we'd be good. But then I started looking at things. You know, the cost of living in Hawaii is unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, it, we were there three years ago. And things have gone up since then, a lot more. So we were, we were blessed, you know, we, we had family, we stayed there in the house and, you know, I don't know if you've seen some of the pictures I might have posted in my, I was working very, very hard at not working. <laughs> you know, I told the wife, go shopping, go do whatever you want to do, just leave me alone. You know, I do have to admit, did not go to the beach. Well, let me rephrase. We went to the beach, but I did not go in the water. I do not like sand in places that you cannot get out of. You know what I mean? You know, sand in the beard is not good. No, it's not. Yeah, but the grandson enjoyed it, and I was at the pool most of the time. So that was just fine, just fine. Yeah, I had an opportunity also to, just one thing, to uh, meet Pastor Oliver, Oliver Lee, who was here the previous English pastor. He is a senior pastor at, uh, at a church in Honolulu now. Uh, him and his family, Laura, and the kids are doing very well. And they send their best. And they're getting accustomed to the uh, aloha life, which is kind of like you lay back and you don't do nothing. You know what I mean? You know, so that's the style. So get that style of aloha mixed in with a Korean style. Nice. Ay, 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 ay is the word I want to think. You might not get things ever done, you know, in that way. But yeah, but it was good. He was good. He was doing very well. And it, they, matter of fact, his church just celebrated their first uh, VBS. Uh, and it's a smaller church, but it's growing. And uh, they had all of 18, which was really amazing, he says. He says they were expecting about five or six. I'm serious. And he said he, they were overwhelmed with 18. You know, I said, well, wait till next year. God will bless you, and it'll be more than that. So keep him in your prayers, and uh, I'll give you the address of his church if you're headed to Honolulu, and we'll look at that. What I'd like to share with you today is uh, what I call refreshing in our downtimes. As, as part of vacation, as we have said, as part of it is for people to be rejuvenated. Sometimes vacations are very, very stressful, are they not? Am I the only one that said yes? <laughs> you know... I, can, I moved 500 to 600 troops with no problem. But trying to move your wife and your grandson? <laughs> give me the 2,000 troops to move, okay? That's not a problem. They fall in line. You tell them get in line, they get in line. You tell them to do, they do this. Anyway, before I get myself in more trouble. Anyway. But vacations are very stressful, and we all need vacations. And sometimes when we think about refreshing, you know, I brought you a couple of pictures up there. Sean, pop those two pictures up there, if you would. Do you have them? You don't have them. You don't have my slides? You don't have my slides? Okay, we're back to normal, I guess. 
But anyway, okay, that's fine. But you know, vacations can be very stressful. Sometimes we think vacations are out of going and seeing so many different things. How many have been on vacations where you just go, you're on a constant going on things, right? Constantly getting up. When we went to tours of Korea, that you know, you get on a bus tour, right? You get on the bus, they put you on the bus, load your bags in, you have to be there at six o'clock. Here's here's breakfast. Get up, go eat breakfast, go stand in line, get on the bus, get off the bus, go to the bathroom, get on the bus, off the bus, go see this, go do that, go do this, right? That's how most of our vacations are, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. But I like vacations. I like times of when we just do nothing. Well you vegetate. You know? You sit there and you go to the shopping center. You don't have to shop. You sit there and you watch the tourists. Now I realize I'm a tourist too, okay? But I kind of blend in a little different. And you watch the people. And you watch them going through the malls and you kind of wonder like those songs that are there, their faces, what are they thinking, what are they arguing? And you can tell the husbands. You can definitely tell the husbands, okay? It's the guy with the pain in his eyes. <laughs> okay? The pain in his eyes when he gets the bills, you know. But, you know, I, go do whatever you want to go do, I said, you know. I'm thinking about that. And I'm thinking about this, is why do we go, why do we go on vacations? Why do we need this time of what we call refreshing? I think there's, I think every single one of us need that time of refreshment, don't we? Yeah, re it, and, and it looks to us in different, different forms and different things of what we do. But refreshing is vital to a leader especially a spiritual leader, because there, there's so much spiritual, spiritual pressure or warfare that's ongoing. That the leader needs to do this, because a leader who's not refreshed is a worn out leader. And literally, they get worn out. And they get worn out, they get frustrated. And as they get frustrated, then they begin making poor decisions. And they begin thinking, doing their own way, their own thing, without seeking God's advice. So a leader, especially a spiritual leader, needs to be refreshed. You know, and, and sometimes even in that time of right refreshment, there's a time of feeling down so much. So how do we, we can't go on vacation all the time unless you're a millionaire, you know, then you don't need to work. But how do we stay refreshed in the times of when we feel down? When the times that we're going on, we're working, and yet we feel so down. Well, I believe that Psalms 42 will tell us this today. Psalms 42. And the reason, you know, as I said, people go on vacation is in fact, oh, he did find the slides. Okay, bring those two pictures up, will you? That's either, now you figure out which one is me. Okay, which one do I look like? Hard to tell, very good. <laughs> that's me at the Honolulu Zoo, and that's me at the beach. I actually bought a hammock there, and I put it in my, my niece's garage. And everybody that walked by the house looked at me, and I was in my hammock, and my grandson was looking all over for me. So I bought one of those hammocks that two people can stay in, and you kind of like... And it was wind that went through it. And I stayed there for a few hours, and they were looking all over the place for me. <laughs> so finally, I had to come out. So when you think about refreshment, we think about relaxation, we think about just kind of like letting it all hang out, as they say. And that's literally what we do. But I have another question. How many joggers do we have in here? Any joggers? I'll pray for you, buddy. No, seriously. Joggers. I used to, you know, most of us used to run in the military, right? By no choice, you know. And joggers. How many marathoners? Anybody marathoners in here? Who's, who's used to? Okay, used to, right? Anybody else? A marathoner? Okay, okay. Yeah. I use the past tense used to <laughs> for all of us, okay? Used to. Yeah, I ran a marathon too in my younger days when I was in Honolulu. I ran that Honolulu marathon. You know, it was great. I was in shape, no problem. You're young and you can run and you're in the heat doesn't bother you and all those things. And you get these, you pass by and they have these water glasses and they splash the water on you and you do all this, you know, all this neat stuff, right? And you're running as you're running, you're all pumped up. You're wondering, why in the heck did I do this for? <laughs> and then at the end of the thing, you get done, you cross the finish line and you, you're kind of like, wow, I did it. But then the pain sets in. And a week later, you're still kind of going, oh, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, 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 you're hurting. Yeah. Even with all the training. But in the marathon, as I said, you have a route. 
When the runner goes through and they get a refreshing cup of drink, their water, they get thrown water at. And certain times, you know, it would be great to run to, in our life, to spiritual water stations, wouldn't it? Have that spiritual water station. And I believe there are spiritual water stations. The book of Psalms, as I said, gives us plenty of practical advice for getting, for getting refreshed. Times in refreshment or refreshing for our soul. Sometimes life can be a real downer and you need a, and we need a lift. And, or maybe, maybe you're there right now. So let's take a real quick self-test, if you will. Here's four indicators that you might be in a down time that we say. Here's the first one. The first one is this. Maybe things are going great, but deep in your heart you're thinking, there's got to be more to this life. You feel empty inside. You feel empty inside. Here's the second one. You feel things never will improve. Tomorrow will be no better than today. Like, the, like your best days are behind you and there's no sign of a better future. Here's the third one. You have a sense of being lonely. Even when, even when you're around people. Relationships just aren't doing it. Just aren't doing it. They're not. Number four. It doesn't seem like you can trust anyone anymore. Or maybe you're just, your confidence is shot. Your confidence is shot. But in Psalms 42, it gives us great advice for each of those areas of need. The Bible gives us, gives no retouch photo of life, the life or people. From Jesus to Moses, down times were experienced by every single one of them, even our Lord. Even our Lord. Our lesson today for how, great, how to get refreshed during those down times comes from the great hero, King David. So it's not on the screen. So if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Psalms, Psalms 42. Psalms 42. And I'll be reading out of the ESV. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul stirs for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How would I go without, without the throng and lead them into the, into the procession of the house of God? With, the shouts, with glad shouts and songs of praise and a multitude keeping festival. Verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you turning, why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and the Mount of Misa. Deep calls to the deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All of your breakers and all of your ways have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me. A prayer to God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do you go on mourning because of my opposition of my enemies? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 11. David writes this psalm, and, and he writes this psalm as, a, as a, an instructive song, as we say. And that's why you see the term uh, uh, maskil. Maskil is a Hebrew word for meaning song or instructive song. And it's refreshing in the times of our, when we feel so down. And out of this Psalms, I want to share with you four things, four elements, four key things to finding refreshment in your down times. Here's the first one. The first one is this, is that we need to thirst for God. Verses 1 through 4 says this, because we feel emptiness. We have a sense of emptiness that's in there. In the terms of, I feel hollow, empty about my life, no matter what I do, as he says. For all, we all long for God, verses 1 and 2 says that. 
And it is as natural as it is natural for a deer to long for water, so our souls will naturally long for God. Our downtimes actually reveal the emptiness of our life and our longing to know who God is. Know God. And as, as thirst draws a deer to the stream, so our thirst in our hearts is designed to draw us to God. Our longing for God cannot be satisfied by anything else. What about money? Well, Christine, Christina Onassis said this, the daughter of that wealthy, wealthy millionaire, Aristotle Onassis, says this, Happiness is not based on money, and the greatest proof of that is my family. And shortly after making that statement, she died of a heart failure, reportedly the result of years of abusive tranquilizers and diet pills. King Solomon writes this, the wealthiest man and the wisest man in, in, the, in the world or even in, in the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 5 verses 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. So what about success? Well, the pop star Madonna was asked that question one time. Are you a happy person? She's asked. And, re and she replied, I'm a tormented person. I have a lot of demons I'm wrestling with. But I want to be happy. And I have moments of happiness. And I'm working towards knowing myself. Assuming that will bring me happiness. Comedian Eddie Murphy says the following, told People's Magazines in an interview. He says, I feel something's missing. I don't think there's anyone who feels like there isn't something missing in their life. No matter how much money you make, or how many cars, or how many houses you have, or how many people you make happy, life isn't perfect for everyone, for everybody. The New Testament records the story of a woman of a woman who tries to fill the longing in her heart with relationships with men. Several men to be exact. In fact, she had a steady stream of these broken relationships. She went through five husbands. And she was living on an empty life of shame. And one day she went to the well to draw water. And at a time when there should have been no one else around. But she encountered Jesus at that well. She encountered Jesus at that well. And John 4 verses 13 through 14 says this, Jesus answered as she asked the question. And he said to her, everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, referring to the well water. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of, of water springing up to eternal life. In fact, Jesus was saying this, your thirst, your thirst has been misplaced. The answer to your soul's thirst is me. One drink and you'll never thirst again. One drink. His water is the water of eternal life. You've drank from many wells, different religions, different careers, different relationships, all kinds of different stuff, trying to find that. But you're still thirsty. Take your thirst to Jesus and ask for his water. And you will never never thirst again. Well, you say, I don't think it possibly to really experience God in that way from a drink of that living water. God can be experienced if you look at verses 3 and 4. The writer is having a down time. He's very down because, because people are taunting him while he's longing for God, seeking God's direction. And he's remembering the, God's nearness to him. And he can't get over it. He can't get over that, that, how close God was to him. Take your thirst.
take my thirst to Jesus. And God's presence will be experienced. You will experience him. He is real. It is real. As real as the air that we breathe and the bread that we eat. The first key, as I said, to refreshing may, in our down times is the thirst for God. Knowing that we have that thirst. Next we must have this. Hope in God. Because we feel hopeless. You'll say, well, Pastor, I don't really feel hopeless. I don't have that. The terms, expressing these terms, things will get better. Will never, never get better, that is. Tomorrow will be the same. Why should I even bother? There's no difference in that. You know, a human being can live, can live about 40 days without food. And roughly about three days without water. And nearly eight minutes without air. But not one minute without the sense of having a future. Will someday be better than today. Researchers at Cornell University studied 25 POWs, 25,000 POWs from World War II. And they, they concluded that a person could handle almost anything, almost anything, if they believe that their best days are still ahead. That their best days are still ahead. If they had hope. We need hope to cope with things in life. And that hope is Jesus Christ. A lot of people have, have, have a kind of hope, but... But they aren't based anything on anything solid. It's maybe a hope in a job or thinking that's going to be, or hope in a stock market, or hopes on their good looks, or maybe it's a big salary or a good family. All of those things are temporary. Every one of them is temporary. And all of them can be taken away. The Bible is very clear about that. And when they disappear, so does their hope. So does their identity of who they are. But our text gives us two truths that are certain that no matter how we feel, it cannot be taken away. It cannot. Because he is always there for us. He is always near us. Verses 5 and 7 say that. If you read those verses, notice the intensity, the strong feelings that are there. Have you ever been around a person who's really, who's really disturbed in the sense that, that, that maybe they're in a deep sense of depression and, and they don't want to do anything? They're, they're kind of like, oh, what's the use of it? There's like that old uh, Winnie the Pooh character. Uh, what's that donkey's name? The one that always, who? Eeyore. Eeyore. I, 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 always, I always want to call him Igor. But it's Eeyore. And what is Eeyore's trait again? The sun can be shining, and we would say, hallelujah, the sun's shining, right? And Eeyore would say what? Oh, I'm going to get sunburned. Oh, it's too hot. Always a negative. Always doing that. Eeyore. And those type of people can literally wear you out. But not so with God, because God will remain with us. And we need to understand that. We need to have hope in God for the help of his presence for he is always, always near to us. If you look at verse 6 very quickly, you'll see you need to underline the word therefore and circle the word remember in verse 6. In verse 6. He says very clearly that you, we, you and I have a choice to make. We could go towards God or not go towards God. Draw near to God. Or draw far away from God. Because God never distances us. Distance himself. We are the ones. Who step away from him. Because he is always. Always cares for us. And will always continue to care. For each and every one of you. But you must be willing to receive that. The word that God speaks. Is love. He places love concerning his relationships with you and with me. His love for you 
is a result of relationship that he desires to have. It has absolutely nothing to do with our ability to deserve it, or we earned it, or nothing else. It is an unconditional love that he gives to us. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. Did you notice what was happening also in that text during the daytime? He says he was crying out while he was being mocked. Verses 3 says that. Verse 10 also says that. That they're crying out. He commands his love to meet you in that situation. God says, when you are down, I will give you my love. What kind of love is this? That could reach into our souls. That he is near us. That he cares for us. And his song is with us. I was reading that one part in the text as to where during the daytime we're there and at night his song is with us. And in the evening hours in Hawaii there's a cool breeze that always comes of where we were at. And I was on the lanai sitting there and that breeze would come through and you would start to, it almost sounded like a song of the wind. And so peaceful. And then the wife comes in and says, what are you doing? <laughs> nothing. What do you mean nothing? Nothing. But you see that song that was there, God's word. God's love just involves us. Envelops us. That's there. We can praise him for the help in the time of our presence. We think by vacationing and things like this is a time of refreshing. It's not. It's only a small physical part. What really needs our refreshing is our spirit. Is our physical and I actually our psyche needs to understand as to how beautiful and how wonderful God is and how much he loves us and how much regardless I could take my thirst to him and I could place my hope in him because that's what he wants me to do. Here's the third thing. We need to pray to God, verses 8 through 10, because we feel this sense of loneliness. You ever been to New York City? How many have been to New York City? If you walk through New York City, you know, I, it's a good place to see on a map. And as you walk through New York City, <laughs> you, you can, there are millions of people around you as you walk through the streets, right? But you still feel so lonely. Maybe it's just New Yorkers or maybe it's New Jerseyans. I don't know. But they have a tendency sometimes to kind of like not look at you in their eyes. You know. If you ask them something, they'll say, what? Yeah. I don't know. But you can feel so lonely in the midst of a million of people. And, it, and, so, and the psalmist says this. He says, I am, I am I'm on my own. I have nobody literally to talk to. Have you ever felt that way? Where you felt you couldn't talk to anybody and it was just, just going to burst out of you? That you had to talk to somebody but nobody really wanted to spend the time with you? Or to really listen to what you really wanted to say and not tell you, oh, just get over it? Yeah. The psalmist says this. So what's this thing about loneliness? You know, we've learned that sometimes that loneliness sometimes is a choice. I don't know if you realize it or not. You choose to be lonely. You choose to be with someone or you choose not to be with someone. And as a result of that, that's loneliness if you choose not to be with someone. Howard Hughes, Michael Jackson, and there's many, many others that were very famous people, but yet they were very, very lonely people. Marilyn Monroe was very beautiful, but yet she was very lonely, as we've seen in history. There's a Christian artist by the name of Amy Grant. And she's got a great song, and she says, I have, a, I have a lonely day today. I love a lonely day. And you'll say, what? Because it gives me a chance to really focus on God. A prayer in the heart. Me is a means of relating to God in the times of our loneliness. Why pray? Well, prayer is, is, is relationship. It's not an informational type of thing. It's a relationship. 
God invites us to join him in that relationship. In Matthew 6, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. The Lord's Prayer, as we call it. And he says, verse in verse 4, he says, Give us our daily bread, our daily bread, so that we can keep coming back and see him each and every single day. Give us our bread, our daily bread. And Jesus set the example of prayer in the relationship. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, he says this, And in early in the morning, while still dark, he rose and went out, departed to a lonely place, and was praying there. So the question is this, how do you pray when you're down? How do you pray, really, when you feel you can't go on? What is it? Or how can you do this? Well, here's three, three simple ways that I have found. You pray from your heart. In verse 8, his song, a prayer to God. Don't be afraid to say, to sing or cry out or to laugh to God. Pray from your heart. From the depths of your heart of what's truly in there. The second one is this. Pray with humility. Humility, be humble. The God of my life. The God is, the, is not some gentle person that's going to rub, rub us and make us feel good. No. It's just his presence. Being in his presence. The third is this. Pray honestly. And you'll say, well, we always pray honestly. No, we don't. We don't pray honestly. Pray honestly. He knows everything you're going through. But just be honest about how you feel about what you're going through. Just be feel. You'll see David cry, say, Oh Lord, I cry out. He even says it many different times. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? David says that cries out. He's honest. He's humble. He's praying from his heart. On his knees. Or maybe he's on his face. I don't know. But he's praying honestly and openly to God. And if we're able to pray this way, great things will flow from us. His strength will come in a time of our weakness. His mercy and his grace will meet us in the time of our need. The fourth thing and final key to finding refreshment in the down times is this. That you need to count on God. Because we need confidence. We need confidence. In the terms of this, everyone always lets me down. Who can I really trust? People will say that. Our lowest times are often accompanied by, by questions. Do we know that there are more than 500, there's more than 500 million dollars spent annually on prescriptions for coping of things, of anxiety medication, of coping? But the Psalms is the prescription that God gives us to be able to deal with this. 24 times God is referred to in this time, in a dying time. David says this. He calls God the living God, my rock, the God of my word, and my God. He has confidence because he is counting on God. And it comes down to that a personal relationship with God will show itself, will show its confidence during our down times. When we feel down, are we counting on God or are we counting on something else to lift us up? To manage our life, the Bible says this. The Bible says is that we must personally know who God is. We must personally have that relationship with him. We need to be personally called one of his children. There's four realities that we need to understand to embrace that personal relationship with God. The Bible says very clearly that every person, every person ever made is imperfect, a sinner, myself included. And we all have fallen short of the glory of that perfect standard. 
Our sins have separated us from God as light and darkness cannot be mixed. So a perfect God and an imperfect person cannot mix. Our sins have placed a real barrier between God and us. And his face, as the Bible says, is hidden from us. But Jesus Christ is God's only provision for removing that sin barrier that we have. Jesus lived a perfect life that we could never live. And he died on that cross to pay the penalty of the sin that we owe. And he rose from the dead to prove that he's God. And all those who place their trust in him as their saviors will be free from the judgment of sin. The cross is a place of exchange. Exchange. My sins on him. His righteousness on me. And if we understand those absolutes, then we are able to have that relationship with God. He wants to be the king of our life. He wants to, not to reign over us powerfully, but he wants to bless us with so much. In Acts 3.19 it says this, Repent therefore and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, so that in times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So in the times of when we feel so down, in the times of when we feel we can't go on, we need to stop and look at the Psalms and see what God says of what we're to do. We're to turn to Him. We're to grab His confidence. We're to understand that we're not lonely because He will never, never forsake us. And what I want to conclude with is this. Every one of us in this room, at one time or another, or will be at one time or another, feel a sense of loneliness, a sense of despair, a sense of saying that, how can I go on? How can I live any longer? Read the Psalms. Understand that God's confidence, God's love for you, for me, is eternal. That regardless of what we do or where we go, God's love will always, always be there. And the times that when we feel we can't get up, He will lift us up. And the times that we feel we can't go forward, He will carry us forward. At the times of when we don't know what we're going to do, is a time we take his hand and trust him. If we've never, never placed our faith in the Lord Jesus, if you've never done that, you won't never be able to grab his hand. The opportunity is the day to do so. And if you so desire to take the Lord's hand today, meet me down here at the altar as we close. And maybe you're going through this times of down right now and you have placed your faith in God. And maybe you felt that you're, you're, you're further away from Him or he's, he's drawn away from you. Then I would ask you to stop and look at yourself. Examine yourself to see what's blocking. Is there anything that's blocking that relationship? Maybe there's something in your life that you need to confess. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to, to make right with God. Well, whatever it is, take it before him. Give it to him. Place it on the altar. And let God's healing hand touch you. Let him hold you and embrace you. Let's bow our heads. And let's review what I've talked about. Times in life are difficult. Times in life are hard. But we have hope. The hope in Jesus Christ. We have that hope that He will never forsake us, that He loves us that much, that He will always embrace us. And as we are refreshed in His Word, and as we are renewed, we are just so thankful. Father, as we've come to you now, 
we've heard your word. And Father, maybe we felt lonely. Maybe we felt depressed. But Father, let us take your prescription that you've given us today and understand that it is eternal. Thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name we say, amen.